Hi there, just a short video today on the cost of capital and in this video I will be looking at what companies actually do in practice to estimate the cost of capital. So I've got a table here and the table comes from a 2004 paper, uh, Bruin et al. And uh, so you could argue that it's possibly uh, a bit out of date but Practices don't tend to change so much in this area, so I believe that it's still um, relevant to us in 2015. So, in this table, uh, you've got a, a number of different countries uh, and this, basically a survey of uh, the, the top, the largest companies in each of, each of the countries shown. And you can see the percentage of firms that use each method. You'll find that there's quite a lot of variation across uh, the world. Now, this could be reality, that there is variation, or it could be that there's sampling bias here. Uh, you've, you've no idea whether that is the case or not. But there are some things to take out of this. Now, most textbooks in corporate finance comes from the US and in the US uh, you've got a very strong focus on CAPM on the capital asset pricing model and you can see that in the US uh, there are nearly three quarters of all, all of the largest companies use CAPM. Um, that is much higher than what you see in Europe when just about 50% or between 33% and 55% of companies uh, are using CAPM. Now, why is that? Well, I believe it's because that because of the fact that the markets um, are potentially less efficient in Europe uh, than in the US. So if I take the UK, which I know very well, a lot of listed companies, uh, they're they don't trade very often in the markets. Uh, if you go outside the FTSE 250, then you get very little trading. And when you get very little trading, it gets more difficult to carry out uh, good, robust regressions, which allows you to calculate uh, the beta. So the beta estimate may not be particularly efficiently um, identified. And even when I look at uh, different websites, if I'm looking at FT.com and looking and comparing a beta for a company in FT.com with, say, Google or Yahoo Finance, sometimes you find the beta being quite different, uh, which you wouldn't really expect uh, from theory, but in practice, it, uh, the measurement of beta depends on the time period you've measured it, the methodology you've used. So you don't tend to see... Uh, this as much, uh, or CAPM used as much outside of the US. Work that I've done uh, outside of Europe, in Southeast Asia, uh, in Africa, in the Middle East, to estimate beta then is even more difficult, and the estimates of beta can be really quite noisy. So there's even less likelihood that CAPM would be used uh, outside of Europe in the US. So if CAPM isn't particularly good, what other methods uh, have been used? Well, believe it or not, a lot of companies just look at historical returns. That comes from the view that the, the best prediction of the future is just the past. That it's really difficult to predict the future. If you could predict the future, then uh, you would be in a really good position. So you can't predict the future, so why not just look at what investors have earned in the past and just use that for the future. So very, very simple. And uh, you can see that uh, a large proportion, 30% in the UK uh, of companies just use historical returns. We also get a, a roughly the same proportion of companies using multi-factor models. Now, what is a multi-factor model? First of all, it's a statistical model. So CAPM is a theoretical model that you can use um, regressions to try and estimate approximations to CAPM. Multi-factor models add in additional factors 
um, to the market that you get in the, the CAPM. So other factors might be gold price returns, or it might be exchange rates, or it could be oil price returns. It, it really depends on the industry that you're operating in. It could also be based on arbitrage portfolios. Uh, so that would be our arbitrage pricing theory that uh, we've talked about in earlier earlier videos. These are statistical models, so uh, there, there is little theory attached to this unless you want to say, well, okay, it's an arbitrage pricing theory you're using. A number of companies use the dividend growth model. Now, it's quite interesting. Anytime that I, I use a dividend growth model in my classes, I end up getting pretty close to the more um, sophisticated estimates. Uh, and I'm just using uh, just simple estimated growth rates, um, you know, future dividends and uh, potential uh, and, and the price today. So if you think about the dividend growth model, price is equal to dividend divided by R minus G. You're wanting to find the cost of capital, so you're wanting to find R. So you've got P. P is what uh, you see. Uh, it's the price. You've got the dividend for next year. Um, that is just today's dividend plus one uh, times one plus the estimated growth rate. And uh, you can have G, which is the estimated growth rate, and that allows you to find uh, cost of capital quite easy. Now, only 10% of companies use it, but I've actually found that as a quick back of the envelope estimate, it's pretty good. A number of companies, uh, the investors themselves, choose the cost of capital. Now, why would they do that? Well, if an investor says, this is our cost of capital, that would be like, let's just assume it's a family firm. So the family firm would say, this is our cost of capital. So as a manager, you are going to have to give us a return at least equal to what we're expecting. So you would see that in more closely held companies. And you see more closely held companies in continental Europe. And I would actually say that you would see this more often in Africa and the Middle East and Southeast Asia and uh, South America. And you also have a, a, a fraction of companies where the cost of capital is determined by the regulators. Now, that is pr predominantly, almost whole, wholly for utilities, heavily regulated utilities, where the regulator decides on the cost of capital. So there's quite a lot of variation uh, across uh, countries and there's a lot of variation across companies within countries. It depends on the ownership structure, the industry, uh, whether the company is regulated or not. So hopefully that's given you a very brief but a, a good insight into how corporations estimate their cost of capital in practice. Thank you very much.